welcome everybody. Uh, so glad that you can uh, be with us for our interview tonight with David Lindo, the urban birder, our celebrate, celebrated birder fr friend from the UK, and our ambassador to Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. So um, let's get with it. Let's just go right into it, David. Um, I like to make it a little bit uh, that it's a conversation, more like maybe a podcast, but we see each other. And uh, first of all, I'd like to know uh, what was your incentive to write a book on how to be an urban birder? Um, I'd like to thank um, the Western Cuyahoga uh, Audubon Society um, for inviting me on tonight to talk about my work and uh, thank you guys um, also to you know for, for getting me here Gloria and Bessie. Um, the reason why I decided I needed to write this book was for me quite obvious because I needed um, I having sort of started this whole trend I suppose in, in uh, thinking about urban birding and when I say started I mean there's been urban birders and urban birding before my time of course but I tried 14 years ago when I first um, was born as the urban birder to push it and sell it in a way that would make people outside of the circle think about bird watching in a different way and I, sold, I tried to sell it to the, the media um, as a, a new kind of uh, lifestyle choice up there with meditation and yoga. So that was my thinking. And I was asked many times, you know, what is urban birding? Because people just needed rules or definitions all the time. And I've always said that there are no rules, you know, in terms of urban birding. It's just, I, I jokingly used to say, if you can look over your shoulder and see a house, then even if it's on the horizon, it's urban birding. But anyway, I thought it'd be interesting to actually put together um, a sort of A to Z of how to to look sexy on the street with a pair of binoculars on watching birds. That's my That was my thinking. <laughs> Um, because I wanted to make it interesting and, and not seem boring. Um, so I decided to put together a book which looked at, firstly, what people can sort of deem as being urban birding. So I looked at urban areas and the habitats within these urban areas, such as you know, rivers and woods, but also the man-made habitats, such as downtown with all the... Uh, skyscrapers and things because they too can form a habitat and I looked at the sorts of birds in well the book is aimed in Britain basically so I looked at the sort of birds that um, would turn up in cities in, in in Britain and then I talked about how to actually look for them and what sort of clothing and equipment and importantly attitude to have when looking for, for these things. Um, so for me, it was the work that needed to be done so that I can say, right, that's it, that's the reference, I can now move on. Um, I think it's very important to have your, you know, there's an idea you've got to have it down in stone so that people know exactly where you know, you're coming from. So then you can sort of build on that and people can actually then latch onto it and then take it on and, and make it their own. So that was why I felt I had to write the book. It took five years, Gloria, um, to write it, um, even though it's not particularly big. But it took that time for two reasons. Firstly, um, I wanted to make sure that I covered everything, and I wanted to cover elements that weren't covered in other how-to books uh, on birding. I mean, one such thing was posture. For example, the fact that you know people get bad backs um, watching birds or bad necks. And I thought about it. I went to see um, a guy in London who um, called himself a movement coach, and he was all about 
you know, getting people to walk properly. And, you know, if you came in with a bad knee, you'd be looking at your shoulder or something because it's not actually your knee that was in pain. But he and I kind of sat down and thought about it and he got me on a machine wearing a pair of binoculars and realised that the longer the straps, um, the more inclined you are to sort of lean forward and droop your neck. And I know it's not so much of a problem in America because you tend to wear the harness quite a lot or wear your binoculars like slingshots, whereas in the UK and Europe, it's more the traditional around your neck uh, mode. So the shorter the, the strap, the less your neck's going to be sort of bent forward. And elements like um, trying to keep your back straight and maybe if you can, to squat as much as you can whilst birding, because I do that quite a lot. I squat down, especially if I'm waiting, and that way it takes the pressure off your back. You can actually stretch your back at the same time. So it's things like that. I just wanted to include um, things that people may not necessarily have considered um, to to make them realise, you know, how it was to to be urban birding and how easy it is, and also how spiritual it was as well because I wanted to push forward that whole thought that um, it's about opening your mind uh, to get onto nature's wavelengths and it was not as far as I was concerned a, a list ticking exercise it was more of a spiritual uh, enlightenment and uh, feeling good exercise so that's one reason why it took so long the other reason was that I couldn't find a publisher at first. Um, the first couple of publishers I went to didn't like it at all. Um, and eventually I went to Princeton, who had the foresight uh, to, to publish it. And I was very lucky also to get my friend Jamie Oliver to write the foreword. And he's a chef, as you probably know. And he's he's got... Um, he likes birds, he's not a birder, uh, but it's quite coincidental that it's, you know, the four was written by a chef and on the front cover there's some chips. Um, it was a total fluke um, because um, when I put this book together, there was two things I wanted to achieve. The first is to, to have as many images as possible, in fact, to have all the images um, of birds, but beautiful images of birds with uh, urban backgrounds and that was a very difficult task because many photographers in the UK uh, don't actually take pictures of urban birds. When they, if they take a bird, a picture of a bird by accident with an urban setting they tend to delete it. So it was very hard to find really good urban pictures and I had to sort of put it out on social media, media to uh, try and get you know more more outside people to to get involved, and I eventually had to turn to my friends in Europe, who the photographers there just tend to get it much more, um, and I had many more images. Unfortunately, I had to throw out a lot because some of them were European birds that do not occur in Britain, or subspecies of the same bird but look different, so I couldn't really have it included. Um, but when I saw that picture of the jackdaw, the bigger picture, because it was cropped, the bigger picture was actually the jackdaw eating out of a box of McDonald chips. And I thought, that's, that's it, that's the cover. Um, because the previous cover actually was meant to be um, a picture of an owl um, with the um, light of the city behind. Um, and that was going to be the cover, but when I saw that McDonald's one, I thought, that's it, that was the one. So that's why I did that. And the other thing was, uh, if you look through the book, there's a few um, images that have been drawn, uh, painted, by this artist that I found online. Um, her, her whole thing was to, she did a lot of painting. Her name is Steph, Steph Thorpe. And she did a lot of painting of rare birds. And she's got, um, she's not well, she has, um, some kind of um, condition which meant that she couldn't go out birding much but she I thought she was a really talented or uh, talented artist so I contacted her out of the blue and she was very shocked and she said she'd never done a book before I said fine it's, it's even better 
I said, I want you to do one thing for me. Apart from draw birds, I want you to, if you, I want you to draw people. And I want, I want to make sure the people you draw are women, predominantly women and people of colour. And she was like, oh, you know, out of my comfort zone. But yeah, I'll take the challenge because it was a very different challenge for her. And I thought she did an amazing job. Um, I mean, there's one or two of her images that she put together. This is fantastic. By the way, this is the uh, the image that was supposed to be the front cover for the owl with the lights behind. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to, and I think this is the first book, as far as I know, in, in this genre, to have women and people of, of colour actually illustrated as birders. Uh, which is a fact that doesn't really get mentioned much, so I thought I'd say it. Um, so that was my thinking as to why I wanted to do this book. That's a wonderful uh, lead-in to talking about the urban birder, and I know that everybody who bought your book here in America last year uh, in November when you were here, the thing that really drew them was the bird eating McDonald's chips or fries as we call them here because our urban birds don't have the best um, what do I want to say diet um, they're a little bit heavy and in fact I have a neighbor next door I feed the birds with sunflower seeds and niger seed and, you know, try and peanuts and things. And he throws out his bread every morning <laughs> because he's trying to help feed the birds too. And I never say anything to him. I could just kind of grin and say, well, that's nice. But I, I would love to say, you're not doing the right thing. But, you know, he thinks he's helping. So I guess we go that way but the first thing I think I want to ask you about is uh, how do you go about finding birds in urban areas where are some of the places that you look for birds uh, that um, make it easier easier for you to find them and to be in a place where the birds will be I think that's a good question uh, Gloria, and I think that um, for me, one of the, uh, the key things is to look for habitats that uh, resemble where a bird would live in natural in the natural habitat in very commas. And I think one of the classic examples was when I came to Cleveland and I, we did that walk down Tremont, and I remember walking past an area which had a lot of brush and scrub and it's only very small but immediately I was drawn to that because to me that looked like a fragment of a natural habitat for you know that you'd find in in the open country and we were rewarded immediately because there were chipping sparrows I think and there were juncos and so you know immediately you saw things that I kind of expected to find in that kind of area even though it's a very tiny area in the middle of an urban spot so part of it is to, if you are already experienced, then is to think of these places as just miniature examples of what could be found out, outside the city. Um, birds are attracted to habitats, and I think you touched on it earlier. You have to try and view your urban environment the way a bird would, and you see habitats. If you start looking as a bird, you will see habitats. And birds don't, I mean, obviously some birds need obviously large areas, but some can survive in quite fragmented habitats. I mean, when I look at some of the birds around the world, I know that in Europe, for example, there's some species um, that um, well, are not very common. For example, in Spain, there's a, a bird that turns up every now and again called well, every year, actually, every winter, called the yellow-browed warbler. And the yellow-browed warbler is basically not the same um, as your warblers. Um, this is the old world warbler. And it's a rarity, which is 
seem to be turning up the whole time every year, but it seems to turn up sometimes in the same tree, and they hang out in the same tree for the entirety of their stay. So that's the yellow brad warbler there. And they hang out for the entirety of their stay. And when you think about it, you think to yourself, one tree, you've got the whole of the country to choose from or roam around, and you stick in one tree. But then when you think about it in human terms, it's like you having a summer home or winter home somewhere in Texas or Florida, and you just go to that one home. You don't roam the streets, you don't roam the district, you just go to that one place you know where you've got your food and shelter. So you've got to think about it in those terms as well. Um, but anyway, generally, if you look at habitats, even if it's a yard or, you know, it's a, it's a park area or it's a bit of rough ground, those areas are very interesting. Uh, so I'd look straight away in, in those spots uh, for, for birds. The best thing to do, of course, is to, by the way, you must excuse my lockdown um, COVID-19 headphones. I broke the other day, but I think that's quite a good look. It might catch on. Anyway, um, if you look up, looking up is a crucial thing because birds have wings. Birds have wings even, and they fly and they can they tend to fly in whatever direction they want. So you'd be amazed as to what can fly over your heads. So that's a real classic thing to do. Just look up. I mean, I've spent many a summer afternoon just lying on my back just looking up into the sky and the sky becomes this amazing arena especially when it's you know sunny and it's a lovely day and you look up and then you see the sky and the clouds and then eventually you start seeing things passing through and there may be barn swallows there may be you know chimney swifts or what have you there might be something that really strange flies up and you think you know you're quite shocked I mean I have so many examples of, of looking up and seeing things I didn't expect. I remember being in someone's garden in England, outside London, and her garden was nowhere near any water. It's actually quite near a wood. And I looked up and the kingfisher flew across. And that was, whoa. But it probably does it all the time. It's just like no one ever looks up. And a classic example is in Scotland, in the... In Scotland, they um, have been doing some work on golden eagles. And the golden eagles in Scotland live in mountain ranges and they're very hard to see. In fact, I've only ever seen golden eagles in Scotland maybe two or three times in my life. Whereas in Spain, I see them, I, I can see them every day if I wanted to. And um, they satellite tags, radio tags, um, these, these birds. And when looking at the actual results, they actually found out that these birds habitually flew over the centre of Edinburgh, but no one ever saw them because no one ever looked up. So it's just incredible what you can see if you look up. So to find birds in urban areas, I mean, I feel very excited when I get to an urban area. It doesn't matter where I am because I just think to myself, anything can be anywhere at any time. And that has, all, has always played out for me, always. You know, I've, I even... I remember being in living in my um, friend's apartment in North, in fact, West London, in Notting Hill, made famous by that film. And his garden was basically a concrete patio, not a lick of the green anywhere. And there was it was walled as well, so it's completely encased in concrete. Yet, in the time I was there, I recorded about 55 different species. Um, admittedly, most of them flying over, but I had uh, a grey spotted woodpecker once in a tree next to his garden. And another time, I remember the very first time I moved in, I remember like a week a week into moving in, I looked out the patio window and standing in his garden was a northern wheat ear, which is a, a rarity in the States, even though I think some do nest uh, maybe in Alaska. But there was a northern winter which I would expect to be on um, a sports field or on migration on a sports field or somewhere like that. And certainly when they're breeding 
in the middle of areas that are really remote. Yeah, one was in the in this concrete garden uh, next to or near to another species that I didn't expect, which was a grey wagtail, which is a bird which is found by fast flowing rivers. And here it was in the middle of concrete London. So um, I always believe anything can turn up anywhere at any time to keep your mind open and don't just think that because you live in an urban area um, and because you don't live near the countryside that you're just restricted to pigeons because there's far more to be seen. And I haven't been to a city yet, Gloria, that has let me down, not one. I don't know, that is very interesting because my next question to you was that uh, when you lived in Notting Hill, <laughs> where was your local patch and how did you find it and what did you do and you kind of just answered my question <laughs> about a concrete jungle that I think that that's what it, I think that a lot of people uh, think that while well, we live in an urban area, how can we be birders? We, uh, we can't be birders unless we can travel outside the city and go to these habitats or these nature preserves or get by a river. But we have a river that runs through Cleveland. So, um, and I know that you did some uh, birding when you were in Cleveland there. And then, of course, it runs into our Lake Erie. So we do have those fragmented habitats you were talking about in pockets of the city that you can use. So uh, how would you, um, if somebody wanted to find their local patch and they didn't really want to do it in their backyard, all that though many of us do, I do, um, but what, what would you suggest to somebody who is looking for a local patch here in Cleveland that they might, or another city, um, where they might look, someplace that uh, they would enjoy with the spiritual, I, I get you, I really get you about watching birds and how they interact with each other and the whole nature thing. It's very spiritual. It's very calming. It's very... Uh, it's very good for the soul, I think. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I'm asking you is what would be the things that they would look for in a local patch? Yeah. Am I live? Can you hear me? Good. Um, no, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think... Um, you could do what I did, which is wherever I am, whatever city I'm in, I, if I don't know exactly where I am, I look at a map and I see where the green spots are, where the blue spots are. So if there's a park nearby, nearby with some water, like a lake or a river, that's going to be my patch. I'm going to head there. Um, it's funny because I was in Poland um, a couple of months, well, a month ago, and I was in a city I'd never been to before, and I had a meeting um, at midday, so I decided to get out of the hotel in the morning and just go for a stroll in a local park. And it was fabulous because I found these birds that, I mean, that I expected them, but then I heard one, which I thought, I'm hearing that here. And it turned out to be a bird called a black woodpecker, which is uh, a bird of the uh, sort of forests yet it was right in the middle of the city in a tiny park with not much trees. So that was quite nice. So I think it's all about looking and finding an area near to you that you can visit on a regular basis. And I can play it back to how I sort of found my local patch when I lived in Notting Hill. In fact, I found that patch before I lived in Notting Hill. And it was um, Wormwood, or it is Wormwood Scrubs in West London. And Wormwood Scrubs, when I first found it back in the early 90s, I found it just by looking at a, a street map and seeing this area of green. So I thought, I'm working there to it. I'm going to pop over at lunchtime and see what I see. And it kind of starts from there because you, you find this area. And the great thing about it is, you know, for me, it was the fact that no one else was watching it. 
so you feel like a pioneer. And then you have a circuit which you do on a regular basis, and every time you do it, you find something new and interesting. It's not necessarily a new species. It might be a new a species you've seen before, but doing something you haven't seen do before. So it's kind of a new experience. And it's really exciting when you discover a new bird, a new bird for your list of your park or your, your area that you've found. And it becomes, for me, it became a religion. I just had to go there, particularly during migration time when anything can turn up. And I was, you know, eventually rewarded for that because I found things that I didn't expect. In fact, I found things that people didn't believe I found until they came and saw themselves. So once you, when you found somewhere local, just visit it, even if it's just for half an hour in the morning before going to work or to school. And you begin to realize who the residents are. So you walk around, you know that, you know, you're going to be seeing lots of American robins, you know, you're going to be seeing mockingbirds and all that sort of stuff. But then you, you might turn up in the spring and then all of a sudden you've got a fall of warblers. And that must be so exciting. I mean, I had that excitement when I had a fall of warblers and other migrants on my patch in London. But I've got a friend in New York who um, discovered them. Well, actually, the park was built in, or established, in, uh, I think, in 2010 or something, um, Brooklyn Bridge Park. And she started birding there on her own and discovered very quickly that although Central Park is a place that everyone goes to, her park was getting just as many things, but in a smaller area, you know. And so it's really exciting when you discover your own patch. And I think the good thing about finding your own patch too is the fact that you can add to the knowledge within your city and I suppose when you extrapolate it out within your region because you can discover that certain birds are using your patch on migration. And that's what I found with worm and scrubs. I found that certain species that historically have been thought of not being common in London or only occurring in this spot or that spot actually would occur on a much broader front. And that's only because people are going to the same places all the time. So I always encourage people to try and find an area of your own to cover. Um, and then you'll be adding, to, you'll be joining the dots in terms of what, you know, can be found in the, in the region. And I think it's really exciting to do that. And I think that it also makes you a better birder as well because you, I mean, whenever I go to Worm and Scrubs, I think, I imagine that I'm in a coastal spot on the east coast of Britain or on an island, a remote island in Scotland or on the west coast of Britain because migration occurs across a broad front and people are sometimes fooled into thinking that it only occurs in the famous hotspots or in the places like Central Park or what have you that everyone knows about. But in fact, it's a broad front. So whenever I hear about rarities or just large numbers of migrants turning up in a place that is famous, I then just head straight to my patch. I don't go to that place. I go to my patch because I will see a microcosm of that. And that's enough for me because to see one or two or something is amazing for me anyway. So that's, um, that's another good a uh, bit of advice I'd give you. So it's all about trying to find your own area and I suppose you begin to love it and you fall in love. And when you fall in love, that's when, you know, that's when things get a bit, I mean, for me, I've fallen in love with my patch worm with scrubs, but now it's in danger of being um, destroyed by development and, you know, I'm, I've joined a, an army to try and fight it. So, you do. But the thing is, the great thing about having a patch is that you have the ability to form that army. Because if you weren't there loving your patch and finding things, then that place would be destroyed anyway. So at least if you find somewhere and realize that, you know, it's bringing you a lot of joy, you bring other people there and they too share the same thing, then you've got more chance of having that place protected than if it wasn't being washed at all.
it's interesting to hear that uh, you have in the United Kingdom some of the same problems that we have here uh, with development. It's kind of wholesale development at the expense of our green spaces and the, um, I think myself, the actual things, assets that make areas uh, wealthy and rich. They, they think, oh no, we can't save those trees. Oh no, we can't work around this. We can't build around it and save it. It's more or less, it's so much easier for us if we just tear it down and we'll give you another spot <laughs> you know, you don't need this spot. They always try to convince us of that. It's, it's very sad. It's very sad with that attitude of development at all costs. Um, so you talked about equipment before and your binoculars and how you found that uh, if you wore them shorter, it didn't cause uh, the uh, uncomfortable, the back problems that you had. But I have two questions about equipment. Um, do you need binoculars? And I know that many bird photographers, like yourselves, have these wonderful, huge, expensive lenses and, and cameras. Can you do it with your smartphone? Um, just wondering, to get started, do you need equipment? Because I think sometimes that's the, it's a barrier to people that, well, I don't have the money for that kind of thing, and so I guess I couldn't be an urban murderer. So I just want you to just, I hope, dispel that myth. <laughs> okay, before I answer that question, I want to go back just to talk about the, um, just quickly about destruction of urban habitats, it's universal. Um, you know, you have it in Cleveland, it's, it's a totally universal thing. And as you said, you know, you have developers that say to you, oh, we'll put it back as we found it. Um, they think that they can play God and just replace it because they have no understanding as to how long that area is taken to grow and, you know, to mature. And you can't just supplant it somewhere else. It doesn't work that way. Um, in the UK, I'm working with uh, a developer who's actually very forward thinking in that they, when they have their master developments, as they call them, they actually try and um, incorporate green and blue. They, they, they build ponds and lakes, they plant woods, or if they're, exist if they're existing trees and woods, they build around them. And I think that's great because it gets um, people to sort of get in touch with nature as soon as they move in. And also kids grow up seeing green and blue and actually realizing that that's just normal and you don't feel the need to pollute it. So I think we need to encourage developers more along those lines because you can still make properties. but why not make a property that has a beautiful aspect? Surely that would make it more desirable anyway than to have concrete slabs everywhere. But anyway, I think that's an, another conversation. But going back to your question, um, when I started birding, I spent the first maybe four or five years without binoculars. Um, I didn't know what binoculars were. I never heard of them until I saw one, I saw one advertised in a, a magazine. And yeah, I, I, I managed, but I think, I think really you do, to really enhance your, your experience, a pair of binoculars could really help. And you don't necessarily have to buy a really expensive pair. You know, you, you don't have to have a pair of Leicas immediately. You know, I suggest to people that they buy, um, because there's certain brands um, out there that do really nice budget um, optics that are designed to last maybe four or five years, but during that period of time, you can kind of work out whether you really want to take it up or not. And I think after that four or five years, then it would be a really good idea to 
make the uh, investment and buy something which is, you know, more expensive, but then that should last for your life. Um, and I think it's important to think along those terms. But I think to get a pair of binoculars is is a good thing to do. It's not essential, but I think to really enjoy your newfound hobby and to see the birds in more detail and you know to search through areas you, you can't really do that they are kind of indispensable um i don't think you need a telescope straight away either i think telescopes are something that um once you become really keen and if you are watching you know over shores like you're watching the lake erie I mean, obviously, it makes sense to have a pair of a, a, a telescope to, to scan the waves for loons and other things like Jaegers. But um, initially, as a beginner, you don't really need to have a telescope at all. I think a pair of binoculars will suffice until you really get serious about it. I think it's a, it's a commitment to get to, pair, to get a scope. And then in terms of cameras, well, again, I didn't have a camera for years. I mean. I think I've only really had a camera in the last 10 years of my birding. Um, and I've always wanted one, don't get me wrong. But for me, it was a toss-up between carrying a telescope and a pair of binoculars or carrying a pair of binoculars and a camera. Um, I think for me, I'm a birder with a camera, so I carry one around with me all the time just in case I see something that I can take a picture of. Um, or if I can't, or if I don't recognise something, I'll take a shot of it and look at it afterwards. So I think cameras are useful in that respect. What I've noticed in recently is the fact that there's people who just walk around with a camera, and the camera is a substitute for binoculars, and I suppose essentially a substitute for their eyes. And instead of just enjoying a moment, watching a bird for what it is, they want to try and take a picture first before they even look at it. And I, I mean, fine, if you want to do that, that's fine. But for me, that's that's not really what it's all about for me. I think it's more about, I'd rather miss a shot or miss the birds in terms of photograph and, and, and see it properly and just enjoy it rather than try and look for it. I stuck my, 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 my uh, camera and then it's gone. So, but, you know, there's lots of... Uh, cameras coming out now which are quite handy. You've got the bridge cameras that are quite small and light that have fairly high magnification. And of course you can buy those big massive barrels, you know, and heavy duty cameras. But nowadays there's brands out there who are making smaller versions, uh, lighter, um, but just as good in terms of magnification. Um, you ask about phones. Um, phones are quite incredible. I did a video today actually. Um, I was in a rice field in Extremadura and a flock of cranes, common cranes flew over. They were bugling. It was absolutely stunning to see these birds. And I just got my, my phone and just watched them you know, fly past, put it online. People absolutely love it because you get the atmosphere and you can see the vista. You know? You're not trying to focus on one bird, you're just seeing the whole vista. And it's a really nice thing to do to use your, your, your phone. And of course, you can, if you've got a telescope and you've got that far down the line in terms of birding, then you can buy attachments, put your phone onto the telescope, and then your phone becomes a, you know, the telescope becomes a long lens for your phone. And you can take shots that way as well. So there's lots of opportunities now, um, especially for the modern birder. And I think. A lot of people are kind of jumping ahead very quickly, if you ask me. They're, they're kind of, I've decided to become a bird of why I need to buy all the equipment. Well, you don't need to. I think the, the best thing to do is to, to, to kind of get basics, the basic knowledge of what you're looking at first. It's not about what equipment you have. It's more about how you appreciate what you see. Um, that's my thinking anyway. So, yeah, I mean, binoculars, I'd say if... If you were to get anything, get a pair of binoculars. Thanks, thanks. That's that's kind of 
the answer I wanted is that, you know, you don't have to go right into it and you should be, you know, be a little prudent, you know, get a pair of binoculars that aren't top of the line to see if you want to in three or four years, if you still are enjoying the birding, then you go more into it. Um, okay, this is going to be one that I want to know, have you ever seen a bird that stumped you, that you had no idea what it was? And where did you go to find out? First of all, what did you do? And I know you have a journal, so you probably wrote down your notes. What did you put in your notes? And then where did you where do you go to find what that bird was? Or have you never been stumped? <laughs> I think if uh, if anyone ever says to you that you know they recognise ninety five percent or ninety nine percent of all the birds they see, then I wouldn't believe them. Because I think that there's always um, things that you see that you don't recognise immediately for various reasons, whether you've, you've just seen it for a few seconds or it might be in an, um, a weird plumage or it might be something you just haven't seen before. Um, so I think that, you know, everyone makes mistakes. No one knows everything. And if they say they do, they're lying, as far as I'm concerned. Um, on top of that, I've seen, I see many birds I don't recognize or don't, well, it depends where I am. If I'm in Europe, um, most of the things I see, I have at least an idea as to what it is. It might be a, you know, obviously I know it's a duck or a bird of prey. I may not necessarily know the species if I don't see it well enough or the light's bad or what have you. So there's always that opportunity or that possibility. And in those instances, I try and make as many notes, whether they be mental or photographic notes, what have you, as possible. But sometimes you just have to let things go. Sometimes you think, oh, I can never be sure what that was. I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I'll just move on. And I always tell beginners um, that not to, not, to, not to worry, especially in the very beginning, to try and identify everything you see because you feel peer group pressure. You feel like you have to have put a name to everything. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes you just don't know. Sometimes you have to say, I don't know what it is. And that's fine, you know. Um, however, sometimes I go to places like, you know, if I go to Latin America or South America, um, it's like almost like learning again because there's certain species and families that I've never come across. Um, others that... You know, you come across the families, but you don't know that particular species. And I find myself asking over and over again, what's that? What's that? And often it's the same answer coming back to me. It takes time for you to actually recognize certain species because you have to get used to them. Um, and I think, again, the best way, if you go to a foreign country, like, you know, if you go to Bolivia or Peru, what have you, is to basically start your apprenticeship in an urban area because often you spend a day or two you know in the city you landed in before you go out to where you're going and there's birds in the city so you kind of learn those birds at a very relaxed way in a very relaxed way because often they're closer to you because birds in urban areas tend to be more accepting of humans so you can see them really close up you get to know them and then when you go out into the countryside you've already seen those birds so already you've got a, a head start you know because you've seen you've recognized them before so that's how i often get over the initial kind of you know i'm in a new place but there's lots of i mean i'm I, I, it's funny enough i wrote an article the other day about my first ever proper world birding trip and it was to y yucatan in mexico and when i got there you know the, to me, the birds fell into two categories. The category one is, oh, I've seen that in the book before. I've seen that in pictures. I know what that is. And category two is, what the hell is that? I think I forget about it because I'll never recognize it. It took me, for example, three days to work out that I've seen a roadside hawk. I've never seen one before. 
you know, and I saw in the bush and the tree very well. You know, I took pictures, still didn't know what it was, you know, because I had a, a field guide, but a field guide wasn't that great. So I had no access to internet, so I didn't know what it was. So it took me three days. And I remember once going to South Africa back in the early 90s, and I saw a finch, and it was like I was looking at it eyeball to eyeball for 10, 15 minutes. 25 years later, I still don't know what it was. You know, so that's how it is. You know, that's that's part of birding. Birding, part of birding, is sometimes not knowing what you're looking at, but the whole part of birding is enjoying what you're looking at. So, even if you don't know what it is, enjoy it. Don't beat yourself up. Thanks for that. I think that was a really great, great answer. Um, so, um, before we went live on this, I said that I was going to ask you one question that really, you talked about it with your uh, interview with Stormy Schweitzer's um, Mapping Wonder uh, series that we're doing, and it was uh, tackling environmental issues, I may not have that exactly right, through the eyes of birds. You touched on it a little bit with, I think, what you're trying to establish with the developer in England about the green and the blue and making it part of the whole picture. But uh, if you could just expand on that a little bit of why you think that we can tackle environmental issues by showing them through the eyes of, the, of birds. Um, I would be interested to know, and I'm sure our audience will be too. I think it's, um, to put it simply, um, you have to try and get these people to be with you and for you to show them exactly what they are about to destroy. Because often these people are making decisions based on looking at a, a map or looking at something on a computer screen and not actually having visited those sites or realized the implication of their action. And I think if you take someone you know, by the hands when these developers and to walk them through where you're going to be, where they're going to be working, and you say to them, "I know this is a small area, but you know certain species have shown up in this in this area, and they are quite important in this region because there's not many of them, um, and also more importantly, it's important for the local people to have something to feel proud about." Um, what they often don't realize is that by they, they, they see the idea or think about the idea of having the green space and blue space and think so long as it's um, green, it's fine. So if it's mown lawn, then it's fine. Um, and I think you need to uh, actually try and express to these people that actually, no, that's not how it works. And Part of explaining that is to try and talk to them as to how a bird would be in that environment. Um, you know, they need cover. I mean, just get down to the basics. They need cover. They need somewhere to rest. They need somewhere to nest. And with any work that's done, that's going to be disturbed. It's not going to work. And I think it's just, you know, I've seen people's minds being changed once they actually come out and see things for themselves and also once they see your passion that is an important thing to, to get across as well but that would come across anyway whilst you're explaining your situation now it looks like Gloria might not be here Gloria is trying to, trying to get back on she had um, it got very windy here some people lost the electricity at all. 
What's that, Anna? Yeah, some people uh, don't have lights on anymore. I know there are several people on my street that have no electricity. Right, haven't had electricity today. Hello, Hannah. Anna, how are you? I'm fine. Hi, David. I'm so glad to see you and hear you again. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I'll, I'm looking forward to coming back. I'm glad. Yeah. Well, I'll be glad when this is all over. I hope so. <laughs> So you are like on a lockdown again? No, not as well. The, the, actually, there is a curfew in Spain. We're not allowed to go out between 11 and 6 ah, in the morning. Okay. So you could go out in the daytime, but it's yeah. easy if you have to get, be there. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly in my region, in places like Madrid, maybe not. I mean, I think they're um, under lockdown in Madrid and Seville and places like that. But where I am is fine. So I've been out birding today, for example. Um, they could do <laughs> still. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's only only entertainment now here, just birding because it's like nothing else. I did much more birding this year than any other before because it's just you like everything closed, you couldn't go anywhere, so you just go birding. Did Even I'm working, best? but I like on weekends I go birding every weekend. Did you uh, see anything good? What? Did you see some good birds? Oh yeah, I saw I saw five species of sparrows in the small park behind the Walmart. It, and take picture of each of them. It was very fun. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> All right. I I don't think Gloria. I think Gloria lost her internet. So. Um, she asked me if I would wrap it up so that you can um, end your day and to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and she also asked if I'd talk just a second that uh, next Sunday we is the second program of the November Book of the Month um, series. And I'm not sure if David is able to join us for next Sunday. Um, if he can, we're hoping that he might talk about Birds on My Mind, uh, a collection yeah, yeah. of photos uh, yeah, by sure. David Lindo. Oh, all right. And the publication date, now I saw on your website, David, on, on Urban Birding World, uh, which is your website, the publication date you had listed as December 5th, um, and that, that there's a very nice uh, pre-publication offer, a 25% discount. On it, so you can go to urban the urban birding the urban birder world dot com tours slash birds on my mind book, um, and uh, um, we'll hope that we can we can do that as well. So thank you so much, David. A beautiful conversation, and I know that Gloria wishes that she could be here to wish you a good a good night as well. Well, she's there in spirit, that's why I know. She is. All right. Thank you well, very much, Bessie, for, for hosting tonight. And thank you, Anna, for being here as well. I also thank oh, everyone sure. who watches I've never missed you. I saw you on Facebook a lot, on your <laughs> trips or something virtual thing. Yeah, my, my Facebook Live, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, very thank good. You. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Anna. And everyone have a good night. Good night. <laughs> Hope you get home. All right. Good night. See you later.